Good evening and welcome to this Four Farmers webinar. Tonight we're focusing on extensive grazing systems and management and we're very lucky to be joined by Stacey Cosnett who will be talking about grazing systems in New Zealand. Stacey is a ruminant nutritionist based in New Zealand and has worked at Rural Supplies Merchant Farmlands for the past 10 years. Stacey has completed a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science and Nutrition and completed postgraduate study in the field of ruminant nutrition and is also a member of the Australian Association of Ruminant Nutrition by Examination, which is an industry gold standard qualification in Australasia for ruminant nutritionists. Stacey is also the secretary for the New Zealand Association of Ruminant Nutrition. In 2019, she completed the Kellogg's Rural Leadership Programme, and since then has been implementing new ways of delivering technical knowledge throughout the farmlands business, developing e-learning modules for in-house training, Stacey also provides on-farm technical support for farmlands customers and helps develop products for the NRM and Reliance feed brands, which are both owned by farmlands. She has extensive knowledge of the dairy industry, both practically and technically, and has a particular passion for rearing young stock and runs a Facebook page, The Calf Experts, which has the aim of delivering science-based into calf re rears in a way that makes sense practically. After Stacey's presentation, there'll be a Q&A session and we'll try and answer as many as possible before we wrap up. Uh, my colleague Cara Green has collated the questions and as tonight's session is pre-recorded, uh, we have had some submitted before the session. So you'll be pleased to know that you won't have to listen to me for much longer and without further ado, I'll hand over to Stacey. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the introduction. Um, wow, that sounds impressive, eh? When you read it all on a piece of paper, you forget what all the stuff you've done. But yeah, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yes, I'm Stacey. I'm a ruminant nutritionist based here in New Zealand. Um, so I'm pretty lucky to live down here in New Zealand. I was actually born in the UK many moons ago, um, but my family moved over to the to New Zealand when I was very small. Um, so now I live in New Zealand. Uh, so as Ben said, uh, I am a ruminant nutritionist. I work at Farmlands. So Farmlands is a rural merchant supply um, company in New Zealand. So we've got 82 stores all over New Zealand uh, and we're actually owned by our farmers. So we're a cooperative uh, and the Farmlands business also owns a feed, man, a, like feed sites where we manufacture feed, which is pretty cool. So we've got our own feed brands um, and I'm a big part of supporting those feed brands. Um, so a little bit about me, Ben sort of told you all anyway, um, but um, yeah, I really love uh, Young stock, that's a real passion of mine, is rearing young stock, as well as, you know, I do a lot of work on farm with the lactating cows as well, of course. Um, but I run a Facebook page called The Calf Experts uh, with a colleague called Karen. You can see us there in our wee little logo. Um, so give us a follow on Facebook if you're keen to learn more about calf rearing. It's something that we always do little like videos and things like that. And we're all about making science really simple. So I'm one of those nutritionists that um, I don't like to get too, too technical. Um, I try and keep it really um, understandable so that farmers can get me and um, can, you know, can understand what's going on. So hopefully that comes across tonight. All right. So what I thought I'd do first, guys, is talk a little bit about what we're up to over here in New Zealand. So I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with what we're up to in the dairy farming world in New Zealand. Some of you guys might have even come to New Zealand and worked in New Zealand for a period of your career. Um, but this is what New Zealand looks like. <laughs> we've got 4.9 million dairy cows, so we've got quite a lot of dairy cows, almost uh, the same number as people, pretty much. Uh, we've got over 11,000 herds. Uh, the average herd size is about 444 cows. So we have quite large herd sizes, particularly in the South Island. So I do a lot of work, I'm based actually in the South Island, uh, and I do a lot of work in Southland and Canterbury. And some of the herd sizes down there can be up to 1,000 cows per herd. Um, so we are dealing with quite large herd sizes at times. In the North Island, the herd sizes tend to be a little bit smaller. So that's sort of where we see the 300, 400, herd sizes, but on average it's about 444. Average herd si uh, farm size is about 155 effective hectares. Uh, average milk production per cow per season is about 397 kilos of milk solids per cow per season. Now I know you guys are more talking about litres, um, so I had to do a Google actually to find out what how many litres one kilo of milk solid is. It's about 11 litres per um, kilo of milk solid. 
So our cows aren't like the most high producing cows you've ever met, you know, that we have some farmers that are doing really high production, but most of them are sort of doing that kind of 397 kilos per cow per day, uh, per cow per season, I should say. Um, so yeah, that's about where the production sits. So you can think about how that compares to what you guys are doing over in the UK. 25% uh, of our herds have an average production over 450 kilos of milk solids, and then 10% have over 500 kilos uh, milk solids per cow, per cow per season. And to be honest, because I'm dealing with the farmers that are generally feeding more to their cows, like they've got in shed feeding systems, which I'll talk about shortly, I tend to work more with those farmers doing that 450 kilos per, milk, uh, per cow per season and upwards. So it tends to be the farmers I work with. Uh, and our average days in milk is about 276. That's just a little bit of statistics about what we're up to down here in the old New Zealand. Now, what we're really good at doing in New Zealand is growing grass, funnily enough. Uh, so we're pretty good at growing grass most of the season. Uh, so we've got quite a temperate uh, climate, although, you know, I say that and I'm thinking, gosh, it's not that temperate at times, <laughs> a little bit like the UK. Um, but we're pretty good at growing grass and having lots available for our cows throughout most of the season. Uh, this is a photo actually, with my um, sessions, I love chucking in lots of photos. So I just, it's a cop out really. I just put loads of photos up during my sessions and talk about them, just, you know, <laughs> that's pretty much what I do. Um, and in that photo, we can see cows are sitting down, uh, they're ruminating, that's what I love to see. When I go into a paddock of cows, I just, it's amazing to see them sitting down, ruminating, that's really, you know, it's awesome to see that means that they're making us milk. Um, and we're really good at growing that grass in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, we have five systems um, that we classify the farms into. So from system one through to system five, and that's all based on how much um, imported feed that the farmer feeds. And by imported, I don't mean imported from like overseas necessarily, it, it could be from overseas, uh, but just generally from off farm onto the farm is classed as imported feed. So system one is a farmer that just feeds grass and nothing else. They keep all the young stock on. Uh, they don't do any winter grazing or anything like that. That's a class as a system one. And then we step it up from system two, system three, system four, system five, depending on how much supplementary feed is fed in the system. Most farmers, a highest percentage of farmers in New Zealand are sitting in that system three uh, band. So they're feeding grass as the biggest part of the diet of the cows, but then they're feeding about 10 to 20% uh, of feed from off farm. So that could be through an in-shed feeding system um, or you know a few other options. Um, so that's sort of where the different farms fit. What we're seeing is a uh, movement up the chain. So we're seeing less all, all grass-based self-contained um, systems and we're seeing farmers move up the chain and use supplementary feed uh, really well to improve production um, throughout the season. So we're seeing a bit of a trend away from fully all grass-based um, to a little bit of supplement being fed, which I'll, I'll talk about as we move through the session. All right, so grass is obviously really important. So I've said we're really good at growing grass most of the time, which is brilliant. Um, and it's the cheapest form of feed that we can grow, right? So it's something that we need to utilise first before we start stuffing the cows with supplementary feed. Um, and uh, really, when I talk to farmers about supplementary feeding, uh, we talk about really targeted feeding and supplementary feeding that makes sense in combination with the grass that we've already got available. So the biggest goal of keeping our cows fully fed and producing really well is utilising that grass first and then using supplementary feed to plug the holes and improve production. Um, and as I mentioned, those grass-only systems in New Zealand are getting a lot rarer. Um, and the reason for that really is because grass can be a pain in the ass sometimes, let's be honest. So, you know, grass is doing what it needs to do. It's not thinking about the cow that's eating it. It just wants to um, stay alive. So the grass quality and quantity can change a lot during the season, like a lot, obviously, depending on what's happening with the weather. Um, and that can be really difficult for a farmer that's relying completely on grass, it can be very stressful, and milk production can be very quickly impacted when we have these, um, these weather changes. So that's why we're seeing more farmers move to uh, really targeted supplementary feeding to sort of um, bolster the, the pasture and provide more assurance that they're going to be able to do good, pop, good levels of milk right throughout the season. And what we found, so you know, grass is a pain in the ass, it's not always, always as good as it could be, which impacts our production and fertility and things like that. 
uh, but also just generally on a pasture-based system. Obviously with our cows, most of them literally have no housing. There are some uh, farmers that have started putting up herd homes and, and you know, covered feed pads and things like that. But generally most of our farmers are literally just have nothing. They just have the paddocks and the cows are out there full time outside. Uh, harvesting their own feed with a little bit of supplementary feed fed um, in, in shed or you know through a mixer wagon in some cases or whatever but generally what we found is that the cows reach a biological limit in terms of how much grass they can actually harvest in a day which caps production so for our fully pasture-based uh, farms the cows only have one mouth and four legs they have to go and harvest that food for themselves. They've only got 24 hours in a day. They have to walk to the milking shed twice a day if they're twice a day milking. You know, they have to ruminate, they have to lie down, they have to sleep. Cows still have to do all of those normal cow things that they have to do. And what that means is that there's only so much time in the day for uh, grazing and harvesting their own food. So even if we give them more food at times on a pasture-based system, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be eating more dry matter intake. We sort of cap out, uh, and that's why targeted supplementary feeding has become so popular in New Zealand, because we can give a couple of extra kilos in the milking shed to our cows on top of what they're consuming via grazing, and that extra couple of kilos adds to their dry matter intake. We don't get substitution, and we get an improved milk production. So that's really where most farmers play in terms of supplementary feeding and it can work really well and be really, um, really economically viable. Um, what we see generally in our milk curves, obviously we have our milk curves that go up and peak and then they fall off a little bit. Um, and a lot of milk is often lost in that second half of the lactation. So about now, so we are October in New Zealand, we're heading into mating time. Um, so we want our cows to be fed really well, but often this is the time that our grass starts to become a pain in the ass. We start getting some heat, our pastures become stressed and the quality declines. So we often see a reduction in milk production in that second half of the season, which is all based around pasture quality. So if we can feed, supplementary feed that second half of the season as well as the first, that means that we can really help improve milk production uh, and fertility and sort of hold up that milk curve and not have that big drop off. So what we're seeing is pasture plus systems being really popular. So we're still using our grazing management and we have to be really on top of our game with grazing management, obviously, but we're using in-shed feeding systems like in these photos to top up the cows with a couple of extra kilos a day in um, early lactation. And then when our grass becomes an issue in the summer, when we start getting warm weather and we might not have as much grass around, we can up the levels that we're feeding in shed and feed more like maybe four kilos per cow per day of in shed feed to try and plug that hole and keep the dry matter intake up and energy intake up going into our cows. So these pasture plus systems are really, really popular. They offer a lot of flexibility. You know, you don't have to pay a lot, a lot of money in concrete and everything like that to pop in an in shed feeding system. Um, so they're really uh, popping up all over the country as I'm sure they are in the UK as well. So really, really, really popular. Uh, as I mentioned, pasture is not always perfect. The pasture does what it wants to do. It doesn't really care what the cow wants. Um, and we have some key times in the season where the pasture can be a bit of an issue. So what can sometimes happen is in spring, so sort of, yeah, I suppose about at the moment, um, before we, we're sort of heading into spring now, we've had some warm days and the grass is going quite, quite well, but it's not super hot yet. Um, in that period, our grass can be like rocket fuel. So we get this beautiful grass. Uh, it's really low fiber or really low NDF, if you've heard that term NDF, really low fiber. Uh, and it can be like rocket fuel, which sounds really good on paper, but not necessarily always great for the rumen health of our animals. So sometimes we can get a little bit of um, subacute ruminal acidosis happening in early lactation if we've got really rocket fuel, this beautiful green, really low fiber grass. So that actually needs a little bit of supplementation with some effective fiber to help with rumen health. Um, and then at mating time, as I said, that's when the grass quality can start to decline as we start getting a bit more heat, a little bit less moisture around. The grass can go to seed, go reproductive, get a bit stressed out, just as we need our cows to be on that really high plane of nutrition so that we can get them in calf really quickly. Um, so that can be a struggle as well. So grass is a moving target uh, and it's something that we need to take in consideration when we're supplementing. What's the grass doing? What's the best supplement that we should be feeding at that time to make sure we're utilizing grass intake um, and getting the best out of our cows. 
A few other issues on a pasture-based system on a, is really it's quite difficult getting macro minerals into cows. You know, obviously we need calcium, we need magnesium, we need sodium in our cows because there's a lot of that leaving via the milk every single day. So that's quite challenging. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure how you guys do it in the UK, but what, what people will do in New Zealand is if they haven't got an in-shed feeding system or some way of getting feed with these macro minerals into cows, they'll literally dust the paddocks. So they'll fill up like a little uh, a little hopper with limestone flour or magnesium oxide, and they'll literally drive over the paddocks and it's like a massive cloud of dust. <laughs> and they just sort of, we hope that the, that the minerals land on the grass and then the cows consume them. Uh, and that cannot be the best way of getting macro minerals into cows. It can be a little bit hit and miss, especially if it's raining or if it's windy, and then the you know all of the lime just goes to the other paddock or whatever. So that's not a very effective way of getting macro minerals into cows. Uh, so we put it in the in shed feeding system, and that really helps. It's a really easy way of making sure we get enough calcium, magnesium, sodium, and all of the trace elements and things like that down the throats of the cow, which can be challenging in a, a fully pasture-based system. The other problem that we have, um, I promise it's not all bad down here, it's actually pretty cool, but the other problem that we have is um, calving in wet and cold can be a real challenge. Uh, so we've had a really wet winter this winter. We've had a lot of calves being born in mud, um, in pretty horrible conditions, and that can have a big impact on the calf health um, and the colostrum quality of the cow that's um, calved that, that calf. Uh, so that's another challenge that we have as well, just to throw into the mix. Although that photo there doesn't look too bad, eh? That looks like quite a nice spring day. <laughs> uh, weather events can be pretty extreme. Uh, so this photo here is taken on the west coast of the South Island, where they get a whole bunch of rain. They actually get six, uh, about six metres a year of rain over on the west coast of uh, the South Island. So they have very extreme weather events uh, and it's very hard when you've got a lot of rain coming down. What the cows will do is they'll tend to all group together, just sort of huddle together and they will decrease their grass intake. Uh, so you can see massive changes in production when you have these extreme weather events coming through with like storms and lots of rain, uh, which can be a challenge if you're just pasture based, but if you've got an in -shed feeding system or another way of bolstering that dry matter intake, it really helps. And on the flip side of that, we can have extremes with heat as well. I know you guys in the UK have had a really hot summer, um, which has had, a, I'm sure, a massive impact on grass quality. Um, and your 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 systems, your your cows. Um, so that can be a real challenge, right? Too when you're just reliant on, well, mainly reliant on grass. A little change in the quality of the grass, you know, an ME difference, you know, the grass quality, losing that grass quality a little bit when it's such a big part of the diet can have huge impacts on our production and cow condition. So it's a, it can be a real challenge, a real challenge. Uh, we've also got uh, a lot of long walks at times, probably a bit longer than yours, depending on the farm. Um, most cows are walking to the shed twice a day, um, and it might be a couple of kilometres a day that they're walking. Can be quite tough on feet, um, so foot health is really, really important in New Zealand. If you've got cows that have got buggered feet, not too good for going out and grazing um, your own food. Uh, so we need to be really careful of that. Uh, like the health of our laneways and things like that are really, really critical. And if we have issues with those on farm and issues with foot health, it can just be an absolute nightmare. Um, so we need to really keep an eye on the foot health of our animals as well, which can be another, another tricky thing to manage. All right, so when we supplementary feed, I've sort of talked about how most farmers are feeding mainly grass, right? So the biggest part of the diet, and then they're, they're using some targeted supplementary feeding throughout the rest of like the whole lactation, really. Uh, but we need to be really careful with what we choose to supplementary feed in order to maximise grass intake. So that's really important, and that's a big part of my job working with farmers. I help to look at their total diet and figure out what the best um, supplementary feed is going to be to fit into that system. So if most farmers are feeding grass and a couple of kilos of something in the shed, um, that choice of a couple of kilos in the shed, we can make some good decisions around that to make sure that we're not adding extra uh, fibre to the, to the um, animal's diet if that's not what they need, um, and balancing the diet to make sure that it's going, we're going to have as much uh, grass intake as we can, maximise that grass intake, utilise that grass as much as we can. Palm kernel is a common feed that's crept into New Zealand over the last probably more than 10 years. 
um, and it's sort of everywhere to be honest. I'm not sure how much you guys use palm kernel in the UK, that would be really interesting to know, but it's all over New Zealand. Um, obviously palm kernel is a really, really high fibre feed. It's got a really high NDF. A lot of that NDF is lignified, which means that it's not particularly digestible. So palm kernel can be a feed that's really brilliant to plug a feed deficiency. So if we haven't got enough dry matter intake on the farm, if our grass quantity is not there, palm kernel is a fantastic feed to feed to bump up the dry matter intake. But what we see too commonly in New Zealand is people using palm kernel in not the correct way. So they'll feed it in early lactation when they've already got lots of um, feed on the farm. And what they'll find is they're almost like taking one step forward and two steps back when it comes to dry matter intake because that palm kernel is so uh, high in fibre and so lignified and fills the cows up. We actually are causing a bit of substitution uh, and wasting of grass if we're not utilising that palm kernel in the correct way. So a lot of what I'm doing is talking about an early lactation, trying to pull back that palm kernel level and get more grain into the diet and things like soya hull and other bits and bobs like that, pull back that palm kernel level and then we use that palm kernel later in the season uh, when we're looking to fill the feed deficit more and fill up our cows. Um, so that's a big part of what, what we talk about. Uh, so sometimes we want that substitution, sometimes we haven't got enough grass and palm kernel is fantastic. Uh, but when we've got quite a bit of grass on hand, palm kernel in too high quantities can start to cause some issues with dry matter intake and grass utilisation. So we try and not talk about the cheapest feed all the time. Uh, we talk more about balancing the total diet. Sometimes the cheapest feed, like palm kernel, is the right thing to put in the diet for sure, but definitely not all the time. Um, we're in the game of balancing the total diet, making sure our carbohydrate fractions are at the right levels and things like that uh, to get better milk production and better pasture utilisation rather than just plugging them full of the cheapest form of feed. So this is a classic, this is a classic New Zealand photo. Um, so this is palm kernel in a trailer out with the, um, out with the cows. So this is what a lot of farmers uh, will do. So they'll literally fill a, a trailer with palm kernel and pop it out for the cows in the paddock and then they'll just ad lib, the cows will just ad lib on the palm kernel during the day. Um, and this can be great, like if you don't have an inshed feeding system and your pasture quantity isn't there, this can be fantastic, a really easy way of making sure that you're getting an extra couple of kilos into your cows. Uh, but in spring, when you've got lots of grass, this isn't particularly a great thing to be doing unless you've got a feed deficit. But we see this all over the country um, is in paddock trailer feeding of palm kernel. And actually with... Um, with some of our milk suppliers, they've actually started putting some limitations on it. So that, that's actually been really interesting. So Fonterra, who's obviously our biggest milk uh, processor in New Zealand, uh, a couple of years ago, it must, it's probably longer than that now, I think it must be about almost like five years ago, um, they put a limitation on feeding palm kernel. So what they found is that apparently uh, when cows were fed high levels of palm kernel uh, during the lactation, it actually had a change in the fatty acid profile of the milk. So they were finding that uh, the butter, I think it was the butter wasn't setting properly or it wasn't meeting um, expectations of like, you know, different countries around the world that were purchasing it. Um, so they actually put a limit, a limitation on how much palm kernel could be fed per cow per day. They came out firstly and said uh, no more than three kilos of palm kernel per cow per day. And there were some farmers that were feeding a lot more than that. So that's quite a big change. Um, and then they moved to a grading system. So they've moved away from saying you can only feed three kilos, and now they use this um, grading system called the Feed Evaluate, uh, Evaluation Index, FEI. And basically what they do is they test the milk for this fatty acid, a particular fatty acid that when you feed lots of palm kernel, it turns up in the milk, and then farmers get graded if they've got too much of that fatty acid in the milk. So it looks a little bit like this. Uh, well, this is literally a snapshot of a customer's um, FEI. And when they're in the green zone, they're, they're all good. Um, but when they start to get into the orange, that means that they're feeding too much palm. And then when they're in the red, that's um, when they'll get a grade. Like they'll actually have to pay a fine um, for having too high an FEI. So this changed how farmers in New Zealand were using palm kernel. Some of them were, particularly over the summer, when there was a, in like sort of a summer dry drought situation, they were just filling the cows full of palm kernel. Uh, and this definitely changed that behaviour. Uh, so generally it's around over three kilos and you'll start to head into the orange and red zone. Um, so that, yeah, that definitely changed some of the behaviours of how palm kernel is utilised for our dairy cows in New Zealand, which has been quite interesting. 
and that's meant um, that more farmers are looking at different options for, for supplementary feeding. So, you know, grains become more popular. Uh, soya hulls were quite a new thing in New Zealand probably about six years ago, and they've really found a niche um, for being fed during a feed deficit as well, and they're a really nice feed. So, yeah, that was quite interesting to see that happening. Some of the other trends that we're seeing in New Zealand, so some other things that are happening on farm, as we are seeing, um, obviously we're seeing that FEI thing with Fonterra, uh, but some of our other milk processes are also paying premiums for different bits and bobs that the farmers can or can't feed. Uh, so some uh, milk process will, processes will pay a premium for palm kernel free milk, so cows that haven't been fed palm kernel. Uh, we also have some milk processes that are paying a premium for GMO milk, so cows that haven't been fed genetically modified organisms. In New Zealand, we're GMO free, so we don't have any crops here that are, have any genetic modification, but we import some stuff that does, like we import soybean meal and maize DDGs uh, from South America, uh, which is um, genetically modified, but we are seeing some, yeah, some milk suppliers pay extra to have you know, cows that haven't been fed any GMOs, which has been quite interesting. And we've had to change some of our products to fit into that, which has been interesting. Uh, the bobby calf thing is an ongoing thing in New Zealand. Obviously, it's a real um, image thing for the dairy industry, having bobby calves. Uh, and it's something that a lot of uh, a lot of farmers, milk processors, and a lot of the meat companies as well, are looking at ways that we can go bobby calf free in the future. So using beef genetics a little bit more carefully um, and having less calves go on the bobby truck. Uh, it's actually, this year's been probably the highest number of bobby calves going on the bobby truck. It's been really interesting in that calf rearing space. Um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely, we're not there yet, that's for sure, but that's always an ongoing thing. Um, and I don't think there's gonna be an easy fix to that, but that's something, I mean, if I solve that problem, that'll be amazing, no more bobby cows. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing some premiums being paid for more grass being fed and less supplement. So, um, you know, grass-based feed, um, grass-based produced milk, um, having a bit of a premium. Um, and farmers getting paid more for not feeding supplement, which has been quite interesting. This brand I've got up on the slide, this Lewis Road Creamery, that's a massive uh, dairy brand in New Zealand, really popular. They come out with all these like crazy milk um, cake combinations uh, and they're really, really popular. Um, and we actually supply the farms that um, produce this uh, with, the, with the calf feed primarily. Um, and yeah, they, they are demanding more and more that non-GMO. So we've had to produce a calf feed that's GMO free, which has been really interesting, which it's been quite cool actually going down these new, um, new product lines to try and keep up. <laughs> now, one of the other things that's a real issue here is winter grazing, more so in the South Island. So sort of where I'm based and a bit lower down, uh, winter grazing, had a, like a massive um, issues in the media over a couple of years ago. Uh, it, you know, down in Southland, we don't grow a lot of grass over the winter. So, you know, we have to feed our cows something uh, over the winter. So we often grow these crops like kale or fodder beet or swedes and feed them out um, like these pictures show in the winter. Um, these pictures aren't too bad. You know, they don't look too bad, but sometimes winter grazing can look pretty ugly. Um, if we have some really bad weather coming through, you can see animals that are like, you know, really up to their bellies in mud. It can be, you know, to the uneducated person driving by a paddock, it can be quite, um, yeah, you think, geez, what's going on in there? And we had a lot of, um, a lot of like activists get on board, um, really negative around winter grazing. Uh, so we've had to change what we do in this space. There's been some new regulations come out um, last year that are just changing how farmers use winter grazing. Uh, we can still use it, but we just need to be a bit smarter about how we use it. Um, so they've, uh, the new regulations are around, you can't put, um, you can't crop in winter grazing crops uh, a certain angle of paddock, uh, and there's other regulations coming in, but it's something that we've had to, as, a, um, as an industry, really up our game on. 
because you know someone that's not from an agricultural background driving past a paddock where cows are up to their belly in mud they'll take photos and then those go to the media and that's really bad for our dairy industry uh, so we've had to really up our game um, at farmers in terms of how we use those winter grazing systems and actually this winter has been a really wet winter and we've had great um, like really awesome winter grazing management in Southland like I've spent a lot of time down there this winter uh, and it's been really great uh, and farmers are doing an awesome job of uh, improving that winter grazing side of things which has been really awesome but there's definitely been some pressure in that space new technology I'm sure this isn't new for you guys over in the UK we're a bit sometimes in the dark ages here in New Zealand sometimes but um, what we're seeing is a lot of these collar technologies come come through uh, so I've got lots of farmers actually that have them on now which is really cool so rumination collars uh, obviously they're primarily for heat detection so when an animal is uh, walking less uh, or eating less and walking more uh, that it shows that they're obviously coming onto heat and time to to um, put them up for mating um, and these collars have become really popular uh, and what I really like about them is they show that rumination so as a nutritionist you can use that information to understand a little bit more what the cows are doing and what's going on with their nutrition which has been really interesting um, in particular in New Zealand I think it, it, it is actually a New Zealand brand is the Halter collar technology which is actually the rumination side of things and the mating side of things that we've seen in the other collars but the halter also has a virtual fencing component so you can train the cows um, and you don't need to get up early in the morning to like open the fence for them and things like that so that seems to really be increasing in popularity in New Zealand as well uh, which will be really interesting I think a lot of the younger farmers coming through are really jumping on um, to this technology which has been really cool I really look forward to seeing how it sort of develops in New Zealand but yeah that halter technology is one to watch um, I thought I'd finish up with chatting about young stock because to be honest young stock is my real passion I absolutely love going on farm and chatting about the the big girls the lactating girls but um, you know my passion is really around young stock rearing um, so, you know when you have a spring calving pattern and you've got hundreds of cows you've got hundreds of calves which can be pretty full-on uh, this photo to the left actually this is a unit that we work with they rear about I think it's around 5,000 um, calves a year uh, and it's really concentrated they've literally <laughs> got hundreds of these things coming in every single day it can be really challenging you know when you have all of these little babies coming in every single day it's it's tricky it's a it's a but it's, it's a real opportunity I, I feel to upskill people on how to rear these um these animals we rear in quite large numbers so we have pens and we might have you know like 10 maybe even 15 calves in a pen so quite different to how European calves are reared um, and it definitely has its challenges you know with disease um, attention to detail when you're dealing with hundreds of young animals it can be really challenging uh, and uh, myself and Karen who's a colleague um, that I work with and we run the Facebook page the calf experts together we often do every year we go around the country and we do seminars on upskilling farmers on rearing young stock which is always a highlight of my year to be honest um, so yeah it definitely has its challenges rearing especially when it's cold and wet and you've got hundreds of cows coming in uh, probably one of the biggest um, issues we see is colostrum quality which I'm sure is something that you guys struggle with as well um, so when we have uh, lots of cows coming in uh, trying to get good quality colostrum into every single one can be really challenging uh, so we do a lot of upskilling on ways that we can make sure we get really good quality colostrum into our cows uh, into our calves to set them up um, for a good a, a good start to life so you can see there on the right hand side that's a paddock feeder um, and yeah you're dealing with a lot of calves at once which I'm sure you, you guys at a spring calving will will sort of understand what I mean uh, so a big part of what we do is uh, training people so I go around every year like I said and we do training sessions around lots of different farms all over New Zealand this one here is a big corporate in Southland so we have a lot of corporate farms where there's like a collection of maybe like 10 farms that are owned by one corporate um, and we go in and we train these people often at the calf rearing space it's a lot of new people that haven't reared a calf before uh, so it can be quite a learning a learning thing for them and we come in there and we teach them how to rear a calf you know how do you start a calf how do you get colostrum into a calf how do you tube a calf so you can see that's Karen there that's teaching a calf 
had a suckle and you can see everyone's watching her thinking oh yeah because she's like the calf whisperer and <laughs> so it's always fun going um on farm and teaching teaching these people how to rear calves it's um it's really cool as i mentioned that colostrum quality is a real big one for us that's probably the area where we focus on our training the most on um, getting really good quality colostrum into day one cows is really critical to set them up for success and probably the biggest issue we see is that farmers will pull together their transition milk and call it colostrum but it's really not day one colostrum uh, so those that immunoglobulin level has fallen away which obviously builds our immune system of our calves so we do a lot of upskilling on um, picking that best quality colostrum that's just come out of the cow that's calved and keeping that just for the day one calves and getting it in there at the right level. And when we see farms that don't do that, and then they move to doing that, we see amazing improvements in calf health um, and enjoyment of calf rearing for the people on the farm as well. So we talk a lot about testing the quality of colostrum. Karen there is testing the quality of colostrum with a colostrometer, but you can also use a refractometer as another way of doing that. And it's basically a way of making sure that the quality of the colostrum is really good because when we have these large farms the person that's actually feeding the colostrum is not the person that's harvested that colostrum obviously it's two different teams still on the farm together but two different teams and often we see poor quality colostrum being given to the calf farmers to deal with but then if they get their colostrometer out they can start um, telling off the people that um, don't give them the best quality out of the cow <laughs> Another real big issue that we have when we have lots of calves being born in pretty crappy weather is navel infections. Um, so this photo here, it actually looks like quite a nice day. It doesn't look too bad really, um, but we don't see too many of these days in the spring when we've got lots of calves landing um, in our paddocks and navel infections are a real big issue. Uh, and what we found is that using 10% tincture iodine, which is an alcohol-based iodine with a really high iodine level, spraying that on the navel at pickup, and then again at drop off at the shed, pretty much can minimize your navel infections significantly. Uh, so that big unit that we work with, which we like 5,000 calves, they had a real issue with navel infections. Uh, so we upsold up them onto the 10% tincture iodine and got them using that, that better quality iodine, uh, spraying at pickup, spraying again at drop off, uh, and also handling calves better, you know, because you can cause navel infections by handling, mishandling calves and they reduce their navel infections down significantly. Um, so just little changes like that can have big impacts for these large units when they've got these issues popping up. Another real issue is when you've got hundreds of little calves to feed, uh, it can be really hard to have attention to detail for every single calf. It's really tricky, it, it takes a lot of attention and a lot of care, caring about what you're doing really, to make sure that every animal is treated as an individual. This is a classic example. Uh, this is a photo and you can see there that we've got um, compartment feeders there. So the calves are being fed through compartment feeders, which is really good. We really recommend compartment feeding of milk for at least the first three weeks of life before putting them onto open trough systems because it actually allows you to see what calves are getting what. And this is a great picture because um, you can sort of see in the middle, there's that little calf that's got a cross on its back that's obviously had some issues. Um, and you can see there that that little calf is blowing bubbles in the in the compartment, which means that, you know, she's just not feeding. She's just messing around on the teat and not getting her milk. And then if you look at the two other animals on the other side of her, those look like okay animals you'd think just by looking at them that they're doing pretty well but we can see in the compartments that they're actually they've got quite a slow suck and they're not actually suckling that well compared to the other calves next to them um, and this information is really gold in the first three weeks of um, calf rearing if we can use all our sensors and uh, actually make sure we're treating calves as individuals we can stop these animals not getting enough milk. So what will happen for those two on the other side of that little one is if we didn't have an open trough system, we wouldn't notice that they weren't feeding that well. We'd just leave them and just think, oh, they look great, they're doing perfectly fine. And then in a couple of days or a week later, they'll look like the little one in the middle because they won't have been getting enough milk. But if we use compartment feeders and then use um, our animal husbandry skills to do something about those animals, Maybe we'll come back and give them a lunchtime electrolyte or tube them some milk or something like that, make some sort of decision about how to manage them. It means that we're going to stop them becoming like that little little fella in the middle. 
Um, so even when you have hundreds of cows to feed, you have to really treat each one individually. Um, and yeah, it can be pretty full on, but it's possible. <laughs> I was actually on the farm a couple of weeks ago and this, I was looking at these little fellas um, in a paddock. Uh, so these are um, some calves from that big unit that um, we work with and they looked pretty good. It was a beautiful spring day and they were happy as Larry. This calf looked super proud um, and it was doing really well. You can see there that it's got a really nice um, quality grass there and the calves were doing brilliantly, uh, which was fantastic to see. The calves had really good coverage over their, um, you can sort of see that they're growing really nicely. They've got really good um, coverage of fat over their back and over their hips. Um, so they were doing fantastically, which was great to see. Um, and if you flick to the other slide, this is actually, if we sort of compare in terms of grass quality, this, this was, um, I think this was in November, uh, a couple of years ago. And you can see there that the calves there, they look fine. Um, but that grass quality that they're getting is really poor. And this is probably the biggest issue that we see in the young stock world in New Zealand. Well, I mean, colostrum is pretty, you know, that's a big issue. But often that after rearing, we sort of have that weaning pro period. And then we sort of think, oh, the calves are sweet as now, you know, we can just leave them and go off and have our Christmas holidays and sort of forget about the young stock. And that's probably the biggest issue that we see in New Zealand is we have calves that are growing really well up to weaning. And then after weaning, they're sort of chucked on grass. The quality goes pretty crappy uh, during that first summer. And our calves can't cope with that really high fibre, low protein grass. And we get quite potty calves that aren't being grown well during that their first um, summer, which can have a massive impact on, um, you know, not reaching growth targets and can actually reduce their longevity in the herd once they're older. As heifers, so this is a big issue. So these calves here, well, they were looking fine, but it was sort of a disaster waiting to happen because what happens is when they're on this poor quality grass, uh, they get full but not fully fed. So they might look like they have a big belly full of grass, which they do, uh, but in terms of the actual amount of energy and protein that they're getting out of that grass, it's not enough to sustain those high weight gains that we need to keep them reaching targets to be where we need them to be when they enter the herd as heifers. So that's probably the biggest issue we see in New Zealand is undergrown heifers that enter the herd underweight and they don't do very well during their first lactation. And then we actually lose them generally in their first or second lactation. They don't get in calf or they, you know, they just don't do well in the herd. And that's probably our biggest, um, the biggest area I feel that we can work on in New Zealand is feeding our young stock better after weaning through that first year of life. And if we do it right, it can be fantastic. Um, so this is a fantastic heifer, not the best picture in the world with my poor photography skills, um, but it's this is a beautifully grown heifer um, that's just got awesome coverage. She's grown lovely, you know, she's nice and tall. You couldn't really pick, in this herd, you couldn't really pick which ones were the heifers and which ones weren't. And that's what we want to see. We want to see young stock that are really tall, well grown out, really nice muscle development. Um, and those cows, those heifers are going to do really well in the herd um, and do good milk production, but also have longevity in the herd, which um, is brilliant. So we need to see more of these and less potty undergrown heifers. So that's um, our next mission, Karen and I, is to upskill all the New Zealand calf rearers on growing calves, not just for the first, you know, couple of months of life, but that whole first year to make sure that they're growing beautiful, beautiful replacement um, heifers for our dairy farms. And that's about me. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into what we're up to in New Zealand, how we supplementary feed uh, strategically, some things that are going on down here and then a little bit of insight into the young stock rearing. Um, but if there's any questions, I would love to answer them. Brilliant job. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, very okay. insightful. Um, we, we have had uh, a few questions that were sent in uh, prior to uh, tonight's recording. So if you don't mind, we'll run through them and, and see how many we get to cover. So um, yeah, first one, amongst UK consumers, New Zealand is the second highest rated food producer globally. What do you think it is that makes New Zealand so popular? Oh, that's a good question. I think it is that we're primarily grass-based, I think. I think that's something that people really like. 
um, in terms of our image. Um, we're clean and green, um, and I think that does a lot for our brands. Um, and yeah, definitely it's something that with the products that we sell to the world, we do leverage off that a lot, you know, in terms of being clean and green. Um, I think our farmers really care about their animals as well. I, I think that is generally anywhere, really. But, um, you know, with all of the farmers I deal with, they just care so much about their animal, animal welfare. Um, and it's such a big part of what we do. I think our animal welfare standards are very high in New Zealand as well. So I think that comes into it. Um, so, yeah. I think I think it's a combination of farmers that really care, uh, and also just a fantastic uh, location. And you know, as I said, we grow that beautiful grass most of the season, um, and we don't have to supplementary feed too too much. And I think that that's quite appealing to um, to people that are purchasing our products. It's always that um, it's always that balance, isn't it? Because you know, some people feel that uh, when you've got cows outside all of the time, that's brilliant um, for animal welfare. But actually, it's not always brilliant for animal welfare. So it's sort of that flip side of it. And the consumer often doesn't understand farming necessarily um, and some of the issues we have. So it's, it's always a bit of a challenge, isn't it? That combination between the consumer, um, the consumer perceptions versus the realities of farming. That's always an interesting one. <laughs> Thank you. Um... You mentioned four or five different systems being used by farmers in New Zealand. Do you expect any of them to become more dominant in the next few years? Yeah, yeah, definitely. As I mentioned, farmers are moving up the chain. So we're seeing less systems ones and more system threes, probably. Like most farmers, we're seeing a higher number in that system three. And I think, um, yeah, I think we will see them move up the food chain in terms of those systems. I mean, the other thing that I haven't talked about today, which is a whole other topic on its own, is that whole environmental impact and all of the pressure that we've got in that space. You know, we've got um, government putting restrictions on things and talking about reducing the number of cows. So I think more farmers than ever are looking at reducing the number of cows that they have, but feeding them better to get more production per cow. So I think inevitably when you're looking at doing that to improve your environmental impact of your farm, you are have, gonna have to move up the chain and feed more supplementary feed. You know, when we feed cows better, we get better production, right? And that dilutes the, um, the greenhouse gases per kilo of milk produced essentially. So I think we will see more of that happening right around the world really with environmental um, pressures coming on farmers. Um, so yeah, definitely in New Zealand, we're seeing more more supplementary feeding being fed and more farmers moving into that system three and four and the odd five here and there as well. Brilliant. Um, some more sort of uh, grassland related questions now. Um, so uh, I've got a question here. What's the most important thing producers can do to improve grazing management in your view? Yeah, grazing management. That's a fun one, isn't it? I mean, grazing management is <laughs> really critical. Um, I think that I think being strategic with your supplementary feeding is really important. Uh, and I think I think you can fall into the trap sometimes of over supplementing to the detriment of the of the grazing management. So I think that's something that farmers need to be really aware of. Like you can feed, you know, five kilos of supplementary feed through the in-shed feeding system. But if you're not utilising your grass best, you know, all of a sudden the profitability of your farm looks a little bit different to what it could do. So I think that's really important, being smart around what you're supplementary feeding, how you're supplementary feeding, when you're supplementary feeding. Um, and there's definitely a happy medium where things work out really nicely. Um, probably grazing management. I think regrassing is a big thing as well. I can't claim to be an agronomist, unfortunately. I'm actually terrible when it comes to recommending how to grow grass better and that sort of thing, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I think regrassing is really important as well, making sure that there's um, regrassing happening on farms. Um, I think understanding what your pasture is doing is quite important. It's a massive unknown, I think, here. So you can send off a pasture sample to a laboratory and get them to tell you the NDF and ME and protein and things like that, which can be, you know, quite helpful. But then, you know, the next day it's changed anyway, which is fun to deal with. But I think farmers just understanding what different grasses look like and the impact of them can be really beneficial. So for the farmers that I work closely with, 
often we'll do some pasture testing throughout the season. So we might do like a pasture test four times throughout the season. Um, and it's almost more around educating the farmer and getting them to understand that their pastures are changing and what that impact that has in terms of NDF, dry matter intake, all of that stuff. Um, and I think that can be really eye-opening and educating for farmers to understand in terms of that their grass changes a lot nutritionally throughout the season. And um, you can start to get your eye in to it as well. If you test a bit of grass and you sort of start to observe what's happening, um, you can start to get a little quite in tune actually with what your grasses are doing and then use that information to balance out the diet. So I think that would be, yeah, a big one nutritionally is just understand your grass is better. What is it doing during the season? What does it mean when it has a higher NDF level? And just sort of wrapping your head around that stuff, which can be quite full on. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, question here, what recommendations would you have around closing up paddocks at the end of the grazing season? So, Closing up paddocks at the end of the grazing season. I don't really know what they mean by that, to be honest. Is that around? I, I, I think this, this has come from uh, a, a guy that um, is doing a lot of plate metering, uh, measuring. So it's, it's, it's when to shut paddocks out, when to take the cows out. So um, yeah. I don't know whether you've got a view in it on that. So like make it into silage? But, yeah, but yeah, possibly. And, and when, uh, you know, when, when to rest it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I suppose it's a balance, right? So when when you've got the when you've got grass that's really got away on you, and or maybe you've got way too much that's been grown, doing some st strategic um, silage, you know, shutting up paddocks and making them into silage can be a really handy way of helping with your grazing management. So I wonder if that's sort of what they're asking about. And of course, that yeah, that that can be really helpful. Um, to work through the grass and sort of the grassing management side of it. But in terms of what it actually does for the grass, I probably can't comment on that because I'm, as I said, I'm terrible at my agronomy. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not great when it comes to recommendations around um, growing grass. No problem. Um, go out of uh, a final technical question here. So what's the most common practice for using fertilizer on grazing units and, and what tips have you seen being used? For fertilizer? Yeah. Well, oh, this is another one that's going to test my agronomy skills, isn't it, Ben? Um, I'm not an agronomist. I, I don't tend to make any recommendations around fertilizer. So at Farmlands, this is my cop out. This is my get out of jail free card right here. Um, so at Farmlands, we have agronomists on the team. So I don't have to worry about fertilizer recommendations because I have these fantastic agronomists. Um, that do it for me. Uh, so to be honest, I never get involved with any fertilizer recommendations on farm. Um, so I'm really more in that space of balancing the diet of the lactate, you know, of the cows and, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to sidestep that question and say that that's for, that's for our, the agronomists of the world. Probably the one thing, um, we're getting um, caps on nitrogen use. So that's definitely some, a, a trend that we're seeing. So we, I think it was two years ago, we had a cap come on, um, 190, one, a 190 cap of using urea, um, and that really changes how people use urea. So we're seeing farmers be a bit more strategic about their nitrogen use, for sure. Um, but we'll leave that one to the agronomists. <laughs> I, I can sympathise with that because we operate in a very similar way. So um, we, we have our nutritionists and our forage specialists who we work alongside. Yeah, that's just what we, it's just a cop out, isn't it, really? I really need to learn more about being an agronomist. Maybe I'll do that in my second life. <laughs> there we go. Um, right, f f final two questions. Um, if you could change anything about the New Zealand dairy industry, what would it be? Um, oh, I would love that zero bobby thing is really something that I would love to see fixed in my lifetime. Um, so I think, you know, that's something that I would love to see improved. Um, I think that there are a lot of animals that go on the bobby truck that get wasted, which isn't good for the image of our industry. I think that's something that we need to work on. Um, and yeah, so that's definitely something I would love to see improved. This season in particular, we've um, there's in New Zealand, there's some people that commercially rear, um, they're like commercial calf rearers. So they might buy calves at five days old and rear them to 100 kilos on contract, maybe not finish them um, completely. Uh, and we're seeing that that is actually quite an uneconomical thing to do. 
So we're seeing that there's not a lot of money in taking five day old calves and rearing them to 100 kilos. And for that reason, we're seeing a lot of people leave that market of doing that uh, because there hasn't historically, you know, the last couple of years they've been burnt by doing that and not making a lot of money. And that means that we're getting more bobby calves put on the bobby trucks than ever before because there aren't those people buying those five day old calves and growing them through to that for that beef market. So I think that's something I would love to see changed in New Zealand. Um, and definitely we're, tr we're trying to do stuff in that space, but it really, um, fixing that problem is really, it's everyone needing to come together to fix that problem. So it's gonna be a big one, but I'll keep chipping away at it. Grand. Um, and very last question now uh, is, where do you think uh, milk production in New Zealand is gonna go over the next few years? So do you, do you see it increasing or do you think you're uh, at a very stable level now? Uh, I think I, I see it increasing. I think that there's a lot more farmers that still could tweak things to get better performance out of their animals, definitely. So I think it's gonna improve. Uh, I think with, particularly with those environmental pressures, we've got farmers that are looking at keeping less cows and trying to get more out of them. And they can do that pretty successfully with some really smart supplementary feeding. So I think um, it's only gonna go upwards really. I think we might have less cows, which is the trend that we've been seeing anyway. Um, feed them better, get more milk production. And I think there's definitely room for farmers to move. As I mentioned, sometimes I, I get in a bit of an eco, eco chamber because I'm dealing with the farmers that are supplementary feeding and, and sort of getting that 400, 450, 500 kilos milk solid per cow per season. Um, but there's definitely a lot of farmers that aren't doing that. And you know, really to fix that, Grass management's the biggest piece of the puzzle, but then supplementary feeding effectively and being quite targeted, smart supplementary feeding can really improve that. So I think um, we're only gonna go upwards in terms of production, for sure. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, that's been brilliant and very informative. Um, really appreciate no you uh, m making such an early start from your end to join us this evening. Um, no problem, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Um, but before we sort of wrap up, just a final reminder for everybody that our trailblazing trail grazing program will be launching again for the 2023 grazing season. Uh, if you operate a spring block herd aiming to make maximum use of grazing, trailblazing grazing is for you. Uh, we brought together our very best grazing products from compound feed to grass seed, fertilizer to calf milk replacer and beyond. And if you'd like to book a trailblazing grazing consultation, please go to www.forfarmers.co.uk forward slash contact and we will be in touch to, to uh, get somebody to come out and see you. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Stacey, once again. And with that, I will close this evening's session. Thank you.